This Torah class is brought to you by TorahAnytime.com. <laughs> okay, Bar Chaba, so the Kol Igor de Pirka here in Kigarn uh, Hills. I forgot that, that's why. Parshas Vayitze. The Ramban in Parshas Toldois <coughs> has the following question. The Ramban wants to know, and the Ramban in Toldois asks, what's Pshat in this week's Parsha? We know that we have a tradition that Avram Avinu was Mekayim Kola Tarakula, even Eruve Tavshilan. Now, presumably, not only was Avraham Mekayim Kala Terakula, but the other of us were also Mekayim, the whole Torah. And therefore, that begs the question, if Avraham was Mekayim the Torah, and Yaakov Avinu was Mekayim the Torah, how could Yaakov Avinu marry two sisters? And the Rabban asks, Yeshu Tmaya, Kivan Sha'avos Kimu Kala Terakula, Achloi Nitna, Heich Nosa Yaakov Shtei Achoyos Bechayeyen. How could Yaakov Avinu marry two sisters? To which the Ramban offers the well-known answer that the main location of the performance of mitzvahs is Eretz Yisrael. Doing mitzvahs in Chutz Aras is only practice, but it's not the real thing. And therefore, Yaakov Avinu never married two sisters in Eretz Yisrael. He only married them in Chutz Aras. Okay, that's the famous answer of the Ramban. Comes along Rav Yaakov Kamenetsky, and Rav Yaakov and the Emes Yaakov asks a question which is very befitting of his personal character. And that is, he says, I don't get the Ramban's question to begin with. I don't understand what's troubling the Ramban. You want to know how could Yaakov marry two sisters? What's the problem? With which woman do you, woman do you have a problem? You have a problem, how he, could he marry Leah? What's wrong with marrying Leah? Leah was a Jewish lady. You're allowed to get married. Doesn't say anyone in the Torah can't get married. What's wrong with marrying Leah? Oh, you want to know how he can marry Rachel? I'll tell you how he can marry Rachel. Because he told her he would marry her. They had a vart. He said, He promised her he would marry her. You want to know how he can marry Rachel? Because he said he would marry her. There's a concept in the Torah, maybe not everyone's familiar with this concept, that if you say you're going to do something, you're obligated to do it. If you say so to somebody, I will do this, I will call you, I will meet you, I will, then you're mechoyev, you're morally, ethically, biblically responsible to do it. So you know how Yaakov can marry two sisters? Leah, he married. And Rachel, he said he was going to marry. They had a vart, they were engaged. Yeah, but Yaakov, you know, keeps the whole Torah before it was given. That's a chumrah. And many people don't know that chumrahs don't interfere with the biblical obligation. You don't have to keep the whole Torah before it was given. Yaakov Avinu wanted to. It's an extra stringent practice. You don't let extra stringent practices interfere with fundamental obligations. He told her he was going to marry her. Um, so therefore, says, says Rabbi Yaakov Kamenetsky, I don't care what's troubling the Ramban. Yaakov was mechoyuf to marry to him. Leah he married, and Rachel he said he was going to marry. They had a vart. You can't break a vart. Once you're engaged, you can't break an engagement. You're not allowed to break an engagement. In Europe, the and then we're going to get to that. And therefore, Rabbi Yaakov Kamenetsky revolutionizes the Ramban's question. Rabbi Yaakov Kamenetsky says, never was the Ramban bothered, how could Yaakov marry two sisters? What the Ramban was bothered by, not a question on Yaakov, a question on Hashem. Question, how can you ask questions on Hashem? The Ramban is bothered since Yaakov's personal commitment was to keep the Torah, and the Ramban Shem likes to honor the commitments of Gedol Yisrael of, of the Avos. Why would Hashem put Yaakov in a situation where he would have to violate his commitment to keep the Torah? Why would Hashem put Yaakov in that compromised situation that now Yaakov can't keep his chumrav being mekayim the Torah before it was given? To which the Ramban answers that the Ramban Shalom never compromised Yaakov's commitment because he was never married to two sisters in Eretz Yisrael, only in Chutz Aretz. But never was the Ramban ever bothered by the kasha, how could Yaakov marry two sisters? He married Leah because he married her and he married Rachel because they were engaged. And that brings us to the topic today of whether it is permitted to break an engagement. Oh, Does an engagement have halachic binding status? Well, so you say maybe in the olden days when at the engagement or at the vart or, you know, here we live in Kigarn Hills in the, the Bukharians, what do they call the vart? Kan chori. Kan chori. Kan chori. And after the vart they have what chori? They have a different kind of chori. You remember? What does that mean? Kan chori, the, the girl gives out sugar. They give out sugar. But that's the engagement, that's the vart. 
Is it, is it halachically binding? So you say, oh, back in the day when they used to make tenaim at the Vart, they used to write formal agreements that the chassan's going to give the kala 100 chickens and 200 sheep and fur coats, and she's going to give him, you know, rubles and diamonds and so forth, so there's a formal uh, financial agreement, so that's legally binding. But nowadays, what happens at a Vart? Nothing happens at a Vart. All you have to do is you have to go to Bar Park, you have to buy that cake with the cream in it for $80, and that's a Vart. <laughs> that's the only thing that you have to do at a Vart, Bismanazan. Right? <laughs> Uh, no, there's no other halachic or legal transactions taking place at a vart. So does the vart today, does the kan chori, does the engagement have any halachic standing? That's the question. And do tenaim have halachic standing? Okay, that's what we want to discuss today. Now, first let's talk about the, the word where the sugya today is bitol shiduchen. What does the word shiduch mean? You know, if you would go outside on Main Street and take a poll, what does the word shidduch mean? Shekel so, before, that's shadchan, shekel, diber, ketel, noisef, shadchan, you know. <laughs> but what does the word shidduch mean? What does the word shidduch mean? So most people would say, uh, if you'd ask them, what language is the word shidduch? 99 out of 100 people would say shidduch is Yiddish. No? Shidduch is an Aramaic word. The Ramah says in, uh, in Yardes, in Reish Chavchas, Perush, Hamizdavgim atzman yikru meshudachim. Those who join together are called meshudachim. Meinian umatsena menucha. The word shidduch comes from the word menucha. Kitargum vatishkoit haaretz. The Aramaic translation of the land was had respite vishadichas ara. The land was at rest. So the word shidduch means rest. Menucha. Now anyone who's ever been through the process of Shiduchim might be thinking no no Shiduchim is anything but anything but Menucha. So maybe it means once you finalize, once you complete it, then it's Vatishkoit Haaretz. I'll let you debate that. But that's the meaning of the Ramah. The Ramah says the word Shiduch means Menucha Vishadichas Ara. But interestingly, the Aruch has a different translation of the word Shiduch. The Aruch on the, in his lexicon, on the word Shadchan, he says the word Shidduch comes from the word Me'urav. Now, literally, Me'urav means intertwined. You could have two vine branches that are intertwined. It's a way of saying you have two disparate individuals that are coming from different backgrounds, and now they're geknipt and gebindered, right? But, it could also mean, Me'urav could mean confusing. Farmished. Yeah, a little foggy. So, both could be true. The time of Shiduchim is a time of confusion, a time of irbov, but it's also what one is hoping for is a time of atishkoid ha'aretz. But what we're going to discuss today is, do, does an engagement have a legal binding status? Is a vart, is an engagement, is a kan chori, does it have halachic status? So the first thing you have to know is la halacha. It's brought down in the Sefer Hanesu and Kehil Chassam, which is like the, uh, the Sefer Halikot on, on, on Kedushin and Nesuin. He brings down, and this is the Haskama of really all the Paiskim, Asr Lavato Shuduchim Aidei Achar Me'am Shuduchim. It's forbidden to break an engagement. One party cannot break an engagement. It's not permitted. We have to see why. Why not? What's the reason for that? You might be thinking, why can't you break? There are no uh, formal arrangements being made. There is no document being signed. And if anything, this could be called asmachta. What's an asmachta? Let's say, you know, let's say there's no financial arrangements given, but the chassan commits himself. He says, don't worry, I didn't give you the ring tonight, I'll give you the ring. And she says to him, don't worry, I'll give you the cufflinks. But is that, is that a formal arrangement? Is that binding? It's called asmachta. What's asmachta? Asmachta is when you, t- when you commit to do something, but on condition that such and such is met, if the conditions are not met, or if you don't, if you don't know for sure the conditions are met, you're not goimer in your mind, you don't have full uh, acquiescence to really give over the thing. For instance, there's a whole question. If uh, somebody uh, is playing a game, of um, a money game where they say a card game and they're going to be uh, they're hoping to win the game so let's say you know nobody should play it but certain card games where people put money down if you lose the money and the other person gets the money it's a question whether he could keep the money what do you mean but, but you gave it to him that those were the rules of the game that whoever wins the game takes the money 
But since every party in the game is thinking they're going to win, so in their mind, they're not really giving over the money, believe Shalim, because in their mind they think they're going to get the money. So too in a shidduch. The people are committing the financial gifts, thinking that the arrangement will work out. But if the arrangement doesn't work out, then it shouldn't be binding, it's an asmachta. They're assuming things will work out. In other words, when the two parties commit to make a wedding together, to give gifts to each other, they're assuming the arrangement will work out. But if the arrangement doesn't work out, it should not be binding. It's called asmachta laikanya. So why would it be prohibited to break an engagement? Well, so this is the first thing you need to know. Taisvis in Masechta Ba'metziah on Daf Samach Vav gives the landmark rationale be, be, um, for why it is prohibited lahalacha to break an engagement. What's the reason? It says Taisvis in Ba'metziah Va'oid debedinhu lehischayev kol ha'choyzer boy kivan shemevayish eschaveray. The reason, says Toysus, why an engagement cannot be broken is because once everybody knows about the engagement, everybody knows the couple had the kan chori. Everybody knows the couple had the vart. Everybody knows they got engaged. They put it on that thing on the computer. What's that thing you posted on? Only simchas. Only simchas, where so everybody has to know everybody's business. <laughs> so now, now, everybody knows everybody's business. So if they renege on the arrangement, it's embarrassing, it's shameful. So says Toysus Achidosh, in a situation where reneging on a financial commitment brings embarrassment, it's not even though normally asmachta loikanya, in this situation asmachta kanya, you have a, a commitment to each other because it's embarrassing. All your friends know about it, all the Rabbanim know about it. The word has gone out, it's public knowledge. Everybody thinks the guy, the guy, it's going to be embarrassing for the guy. He's going to get called up for Nalir. Yeah, I'm right, ha'chosen. And he's going to turn white, because, right? Or everybody, people are going to be going over to her, giving her gifts, and what's she going to do? It's embarrassing for both. So for any tzad to break the engagement, it's also, why? Even though normally, asmachta loy kanya, in a situation of embarrassment, asmachta kanya. Rabbi well, Sai. Why, why? What's come out asmachta? What do you want to say? You're not allowed to embarrass somebody. It's an issue of not to embarrass somebody. Okay. You don't need asmachta. You know, you don't have to be, call somebody to be to be embarrassed. The answer is, uh, stam, yeah, but, but uh, if one party feels this is not going to be a good shidduch, so they're not actively embarrassing the person, they're 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 reneging, and because of that, it's going to cause shame. So it sounds like that is not enough of a reason to say you can't renege. It's the it causes the commitment to be binding. It causes the financial arrangement to be binding. That's the types of sasara. You know, it's not you getting up in shul and, and saying, you know that person, they're, they're, they're a terrible, they're a, and you're, mevai, you're not mevayish them actively berabim, you're backing off, and as a result, begrama, the person is suffering shame. It sounds like that, maybe it wouldn't be midos toivos, but nevertheless, it, would not, it doesn't make it binding. What makes it binding is the busha makes the financial arrangements binding. That's what Taisha says. When you heard last week, you and Tomar, she was ready to go into the fire, you know, and not to be mevayish. Okay, okay. I hear. I that's, what, that's a sort of twist. Sorry, okay. Now, Rabbi Isai, uh, the, the rest of today's shir is not for a general audience. <laughs> but some of the cases that we're going to learn about, we'll, right? We'll, we'll have to use discretion. We'll put a, a rating on the shir. But uh, all these cases are, are from the Svarim, classic uh, Shal Satshuva Svarim. Some of them are quite uh, interesting. We begin with um, Shal Satshuva's Maharaj Dam. Evan Oezer, Simon Chav Gimel, number 7 on your sheets. Maharaj Dam, Rav Shmuel Di Modina who was Nifter in the year 1546. He was the Talmud of Rabbi Yosef Taichik. Rabbi Yosef Taichik was one of the contemporaries of the Beis Yosef. Someone who was eligible possibly to be the one to write the Shulchan Aruch. The Chida writes about him that we accept his words on the same level as the Rambam himself. He talks about an amazing case. Ready for the story? Maisa Shahaya. Maisa Shahaya Kachaya. There's a man by the name of Ruvain. Ruvain had a daughter, Leah. Ruvain looking for a, a son-in-law for, uh, for himself. He's looking for a husband for Leah. And he finds a terrific guy. Shimon, Alamilas. And they get engaged. They had a Kan Chori. They had a Vart. They had an engagement party. Everything. Al Chayim. All the various wastes of times. They did everything. <laughs> and what happened was Ruvain had another daughter named Rachel. Rachel was married to Levi. Levi was a great guy. Levi was the best husband in the world. Levi dropped dead. Now, Rachel... Rachel... Rachel dropped dead. 
Rachel dropped dead, yeah. Oh boy! <laughs> Levi was the Rachel man. dropped dead, you're right. Rachel dropped dead. And then, <laughs> Levi <laughs> Nevach <laughs> is a good son in law, good guy. He's an almond. He's looking for a wife. So Reuben says to himself, instead of me giving over Leah to Shimon, who knows what Shimon is? He looks like a good guy, but you know, he doesn't have a track record. Let me give him to my first son in law, Levi. Levi proved to be a good uh, husband. To, to Rachel, Mustama will be a good husband to Leah. So the father wants to break the Shidduch between Shimon and Leah and give over Leah to his first son in law. His first son in law, Leah. Oh, uh, Levi. What? No, they weren't, they weren't married. No, no, they were just engaged. Yeah. They just had a vart. That's it. They ordered the cake from Barra Park. That's all they did. They had a vart, but they weren't married. They weren't married. Now, Shimon said, no way, we're engaged. Leah said, no way, I like Shimon. Shimon's my man. Shimon's my, my future husband. She doesn't, want to go, she doesn't want to go along with it. What happens? What happens is, the father, Ruvain, doesn't want to hear anything about uh, Leah living with Shimon. So he demands that they break off the engagement. So what does he do? He takes all the gifts that... Shimon gave to Leah, and he throws it back in his face. What does Shimon do? Shimon takes all the gifts that the Shvar gave him, he throws it back in the Shvar, and all bets are off. But Leah says, I don't want to marry Levi. Le- Levi is a, is a brother-in-law. He, I don't, I'm not interested in him. He's already uh, an alta an out, an out guy, an alta bocher now. I want to marry Shimon. I want to marry Shimon. So what does she do? She moves in with Shimon. She lives with Shimon. Without and they're being married, without being married, yeah. they move in together. Wow. And the um, father Ruvain wants to get the rabbanim involved. He says, "What a maneuver the Shimon is! He's living with her without kedushin, and it gets a whole thing." And um, the rabbanim say, "Look, he was engaged to her. Now they're living together. It's inevitable. Just let it happen. They're, you know, let it happen." So he says, "Fine, but I'll let it happen on one condition." I'll give my daughter Leah to Shemayin in, in, in Kedushin, provided that we do it, Kedarach Kol she needs to move back into my house, and then I'll deliver her into, into Shimon's house like a mensch. We'll do it like the Kasher V'yasher. She said, I'm not moving back into my father's house. After he tried to, you know, uh, to undermine my marriage to Shimon, he tried to, he tried to intercept it, and uh, she doesn't want to move back in. And the question came to the Rabbanim, who's right? Is Ruvain right? Is Shimon right? What should be done in this case? This is, a, this is a true story? True story. True story. Is that what Says the Marashdam, who's right? Ruvain is an Avarian. Ruvain is a Russia. Why? Because once he committed himself to give over his daughter Leah to Shimon, he cannot break the Shalom. You cannot break an engagement. Once a father commits his daughter and they have a formal a formal agreement to get engaged, it may not be broken under any circumstances. Ah, you think he's a mono? No. That's what's going to happen. That's what, if you don't let it happen, that's what's going to happen. And I says the Marashtam, what kind of formal arrangement? Just because he committed himself financially. But it's an asmachta. So the Marashtam cites Taisus in the last paragraph. And the Marashtam says like this. He says, We know, Goloi v'yadua, we all know how much the Chachamim value the dignity of a person. We know that Kavad Abriyas is Doicha Alav to the point where we say, even though Asmach Toloi Kanya, Im calls a Pasku Balei Toisvis, that Shiduchim is different because of the Busha factor. Therefore, in this case, it's an Avla Gomor that Ruven tried to be Mavatal the Shiduch. And Ruvay needs to give over his daughter Leah to Shemaim. Okay. Another story. Yeah. In, in, in a case like that, wouldn't the, the fact that uh, she moved to they were living together, that wouldn't be considered a marriage? A marriage? Uh, they, didn't, they didn't do Kedushin. What's that? They didn't do Kedushin. In such case, wouldn't... That's a, that's a Shiloh, whether in Adam, Bayel, Bilas, or Bilas, Nus, you know, whether... It's not. It's not. I mean, it was Dafka for. No, they weren't. They weren't getting married. They weren't getting married. What? That was their intention. They were. They were going to eventually get married, but they weren't. Uh, they weren't there yet. It would seem in a case like this that that was that was their intention of moving in. No, 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 no. They they didn't. 
No, they were they were they were uh, observant Jews. They didn't have they wanted to do kedushin. In the meantime, this was a way of protest what their father did. That wasn't the, that circumstance. And I presume, I presume that she went to Mikra before. I wasn't there. I don't know. No. Okay. Doesn't say. I don't know. Of course, there are any chorus. Avada. You know. Avada. We'll talk about these type of situations. <laughs> number eight. Number eight. Shal sechumis abnei nezer choshemish v'tzun pei gimel. Besula yisayma. You have a young girl, she's an orphan, she doesn't have a father, and she was engaged to a bachar, and after the engagement, all of a sudden, hey bachar, you look like a strong guy, you're coming to the army. So the, the Kala says to him, when are you coming back? He said, seven years. That's the way it was. Seven years! So the mother said, get out of here, adios amigo, I have to marry off my daughter or somebody else. I don't have a husband. I can't continue to pay for her in the house anymore. I can't buy her things anymore. I need a husband to take care of her. I'm going to marry her off to somebody else. Can a mother be mavatel in a, a shidduch? She had a vart. She had the kan chori. She had. Could the mother be mavatel the shidduch in a situation where the guy ain't coming back for seven years? Says Avnei Nezer, who wants to be mavatel the shidduch over here? The mother. I didn't know the mother-in-law is marrying the guy. Interesting. No, it's the girl who's marrying the guy. If she wants to go through with it, then she's mechayif to go through with it. And the Avnei Nezer quotes a very frightening um, nuance to this whole sugya of why engagement is binding. So far we saw a few different stories. Rabbi Yaakov Kamenetsky says, why is an engagement binding? Because you said you're going to marry them. The Toysva says, because of the embarrassment factor. Says the Avnei Nezer, the reason why it's binding is because of the famous story of the Cholda and the Bar. Mesechta Tainas Andav Ches. This story is quoted by at least three Rishonim, Rashi, Toysva and the Aruch. <coughs> the Aruch adds some interesting details. There's a story like this. There was a woman, she was thirsty, she was looking for some water. And she sees a pit of water. And she goes down, she bends down to fetch some water from the well. And she falls into the well. And she's screaming for help, 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 save me, save me. And a young man passes by, and he says, what's the problem? He says, what's the problem? You seem about to drown. So, so uh, he says, well, if I save you, what will you give me? She said, and they agreed that if he would save her, he would marry her, she would not marry anybody else, and he would not marry anybody else. So he saves her, and they both come out of the pit. And she says, well, who's going to be the witness that, to this deal that we made between ourselves? So there was nobody around, except for the pit and a weasel that was passing by. So they said, let the pit and the weasel be the witness. Okay, and many years passed, and he kept his end of the deal, she kept her end of the deal. But as these things go, she kept her end of the deal more than he kept his end of the deal. And after time passed, he forgot about it, and he married another lady. And they had two kids. He weaseled out. He weaseled out of it. Very good. Good work. But then, listen to what happened. The first kid was bit by a weasel and was killed. And the second kid fell into a pit and drowned. And the wife said, what's going on here? He, she, she turned to her husband. This is Mama Misa Mashuna, two children to die like this. What happened? What did you do wrong? And he told her the old story that he had committed to marry someone else and the witnesses were the weasel on the pit. And she said, well, then I'm not your Bashar. And he divorced her and he found her. And according to the Aruch, the details were, he went to find her. Meanwhile, she was keeping her end of the deal. So anytime there was a prospective shidduch that came her way, she acted like she was epileptic and also a hiker as well. She had, she had alamilas, right? So, and the guy comes, the guy comes to the... The guy comes to the door, and she comes to the door like a, like a, an abachal, and he said, you know who I am? She said, I don't care who you are. And he said, I'm, I'm, the, I'm, the, I'm the weasel, I'm the old guy who committed to marry you. And they got married, and they lived happily ever after. Says the Gemara, Look how much faith, look how powerful faith is. That if someone puts their faith in a pit and a weasel, the pit and the weasel will come through for them. All well, the more so, someone who puts their faith in the Rebbein Hashem, the Rebbein Hashem will come through for them. What do we see from here? That if you give somebody your word, and you tell them, I will do so and so, you cannot break it, no matter what. And the consequences are very severe. So if a boy tells a girl, and a girl tells a boy, and they agree to get married, with, and even, we'll, we'll see, whether yes, tam or no, tam. But once there's some type of 
formal agreement to get married, you cannot break an honest agreement <coughs> under any circumstance. Says Abne Nezer, if the girl is willing to wait seven years, and that's something which is debatable, she may not be obligated to wait seven years, but if she's willing to wait seven years, the mother cannot break the commitment to this boy. That's what Abne Nezer paskins. Now, okay, so you'll say, you can't break it. You gave the word, it's embarrassing, the, the, the pit and the weasel, but what happens if you break it? I mean, it's a free country. You, you're not supposed to, but is there any penalty? What we're going to learn is, there's a cherem of the Rishonim not to break an engagement. The cherem. The same way there's something called cherem derabbeinu gershon. Right? What's cherem derabbeinu gershon? Cherem derabbeinu gershon is that no, you can't marry two wives. So somebody says, you know what? It's not for me. I, I, don't, I, I don't hold to that. I don't hold to that. Rabbeinu Gershon, Ma'ar HaGayla, put a cherem on anyone who violates this halacha. Well, by the same token, the Rishonim put a cherem on somebody who violates this prohibition of breaking a, a shidduch. The Dark Yemosh, the Ramah, brings down in Evan Ezer Simen Nun, Va'ayin la'el v'hagoyis Mordechai de Yevamos, Perek HaKhoyle, it's Ayin Be, Amir Beiz, Ma'ashma de Yesh cherem ha'kehilois, Ami she'choyzer b'shiduchin. Ve'ein lo'i heter, you need a lot of Rabbanim. What we're going to learn is, what do you need more Rabbanim to break? To marry two wives or to break an engagement? <laughs> to marry two wives, you need Heter Meir Rabbanim. To break an engagement, you need Meir of Rabbanim. Wow. Wow. Meir of Rabbanim. Even today? Even today. We'll see. We'll see about that. So you say, Cherem, uh, he, he doesn't say it, I'll, I'll show you who says it. He just says, Hataras Harbe Anoshim. Now, again, we're not talking where both sides have a mutual agreement. We're talking about where one side wants to break the Shidduch. Both sides having a mutual agreement may be different. The Marashtam, uh, no, excuse me, Shal Shuz Marsham. Marsham. Marsham says, Which Rishonim made this Takana? Which Rishonim? We know Cherem de Rabbeinu Gershom was a Cherem of Rabbeinu Gershom. Which Rishonim made this Takana on an engagement? No less than he quotes with the bar Cherem Shal Shiduchim, look in Shuvas Noidah Behuda, and the Cherem Akad Moinim in the, the Shuvas Mari Baruch, Rabbeinu Tam Virashbam. Rabbeinu Tam. Now you should know, Rabbeinu Tam, the Rush writes, was the greatest of all the Rishonim. Rabbeinu Tam and the Rashbam. And 150 Rabbanim. And it's considered Takanas Bezdin Hagadol in, of, of Kal Yisrael. So it's a pretty serious thing. It's not just an Isser, but it also comes with a Cherem. Now Isurim, really, in a person's mind, an Isser should be worse than a Cherem. Isser is an Isser. But Lamaisa, what, what carries weight to people when they hear the word Cherem, Cherem de Rabbeinu Gershom, everybody knows, right? But this is, it's a Mamish a Cherem. And this is Halacha. Um, it's of the word, or is it specifically and more particularly the shidduch? Which is it? I mean, it's the shidduch. Why? So breaking your word is uh, this uh, Wait, that the shidduch? It's the shidduch. In other words, let's say somebody says, "I'll call you in an hour," and they don't call the person in an hour. They're, they're not in cherem. They broke their word. But it's uh, this type of agreement. A word to get married is a serious thing, and, and the chacham put again because of the embarrassment factor, because of the you put. You sort of put good faith in the other person. So for all these factors, they put a cherem on it. Um, now what if, now here's the, the question. question is, again, just to summarize, it's brought down in, in the modern day, in the Nisun Kil Chasam, it brings down this cherem of the Rishonim, that they put a cherem not to be a shidduch. And the question is, what about Bizman Hazeh? What about Bizman Hazeh? Because as we know, it used to be in the olden days when a, when a shidduch was made, they wrote to none, they wrote official financial still agreements. Still it's, nowadays we write it at the, the wedding. The Hasidim do it. Your? The Hasidim do it. The Hasidim do it. Okay, I'm, I'm talking about by, by us over here. By the way, by us, the tanam we write at the wedding is meaningless. What? It's meaningless? Meaningless. It is meaningless. It's meaningless. It has no meaning. You mean it's just a formality? Yes. It's just another. It's or another way of saying it is enoy klum. You know what enoy klum means? It means nothing. It means nothing. So either meaningless or means nothing, <laughs> right? 
So that's what Ramosha says. Either way, it doesn't mean anything. So it would mean something if you wrote it at the Tanam, at the wedding, it doesn't mean anything. Ramosha says it, not my, my thing. But, so, Rabbi, so, why is it done? If that's the case, it's done. Why is it done? It's a tradition, whatever it is. But, but uh, so the question is, if Bishlama, you could say if there's... And one of the reasons why Ramosha didn't want there to be Tanam at Avart is because it... it once you have Tanaim, it makes it much more formalized. Right, right. But what nowadays, where most people in our neighborhoods do not make the Tanaim at the Vart, is the Vart standing? Does it have halachic significance? In other words, without a Tanaim, can one break an engagement? Comes of Moshe Feinstein in Evan Ezer, Chilak Aleph, Simon Sadik Aleph, a landmark tshuva. He says, Okay, here's where Moshe Shaila. Shaila's like this. You have a guy, he's looking to get married, and he sees his friend going out with a girl once, twice, and he says, you know what? She's my Bashar, I like her. <clears throat> could, she, could he come in and, so to speak, steal, steal the girl? Could he, inter- could he intercept? Yeah. Or do we call it Oni Hamhapich Becharara? Right? Or is it called, right? what's Oni Hamhapich Becharara? Where if you know somebody is a customer of another person and they're already involved to, so to, to some extent in dealing with each other, for you to come and, let's say, you know, figure out, get, you know, cut off their telephone connection and, and say, <clears throat> yeah, the boss asked me, uh, he can't take the order right now, he said you should order from me today. It's only I'm happy with Harara. You're, you're undermining someone else's business. So if somebody, if you know somebody else is going out with a girl, could you somehow try to intercept and get involved? With it. Get involved. So Moshe says like this, but could somebody else try to get involved with her or is it only I'm happy with Harara? He says like this, as l- if they went out one time, you could go for it. If she- they went out two times, you could get involved. If they went out a thousand times, you could get involved. That might not be nice, but halakhically, it's not a problem. But, once they have a haskama between them ah. to finish to seal the deal, ah. Ah. then, ah. if it's a derech to make a kinyan or to make a tenoyim, so in a community where they make a Tanoim, or they make a Kenyan, if they didn't make the Tanoim, they don't make the Kenyan yet, then there's a Shaila. If they made the Kenyan, they made the Tanoim. Or, in a Makoim that there's no a Minog to make a Tanoim, what do they do? They just have a Vart. In a community where they don't make Tanoim, once there's a Vart, it's also to break the Shidduch and the Mela if you try to intercede your Ani HaMahapich B'Charara. Says Rav Moshe, V'imkar Asu Kinyin, Aksiv As Tanoim, Ayaf Lai Asu Klum, V'imkar Meshe Noyagin B'Dav Galasa Yis Eza Davar, like B'Medino Yisenu, he says that which we write at Tamil Chopa, Enoi Klum, Kvar Chal HaChirem, says Rav Moshe. Rav Moshe says a major Chedosh, that B'zman Hazeh, once the two parties come together in a house and they eat that creamy cake from Bar Park, <laughs> then the halacha is, if they break, if one party wants to break it, <laughs> it's usr, and they violated the cheyrem of the Rishainam. Wow. But there's no tanam. No, there's no halachas, there's no kinyan, nobody picked up a pen or a gartel, there's no mechira. That is gemar hashidduch, and uh, it's chal already, the cheyrem, Rabbi Notame, and, and the Rashbam. That's a chiddush Rabbi Moshe. It's a very frightening thing. Um, so now the question is, are there any circumstances? And by the way, Rabbi said this whole topic should be only academic. All of the shaduchim that we're involved in should only be shar of akayim. Should be without any pickbook, and it should be b'shalom. This is just to know the inyan. Are there any circumstances where maybe one side could back out? So first of all, what if the chasan became makolkal? No, in other words, like this. Not that he was always makolkal. If the guy was always a bum. So, she knew what she was getting into. Or she should have known. But he became a kolkal. What's an example he became a kolkal? He, uh, he, became, he started gambling. And that's, that's his livelihood. It depends. There's an afkmin between Svardim and Ashkenazim. Svardim even occasionally cannot gamble. By Ashkenazim, it's only on a steady way. Oh, it's a separate sugya. What? It's machlek, it's between the Mechaber and the Ramah. Really? Whether you become, uh, whether it apostles you. Whether it's even Ba'akroi or only Bekvias, Machlok is Machab Rama, the Sadim are much more Machmir. Yeah. What? Because it's Machta. It's, it's, right. 
even once by his father? By his father, they can ever do it. Yeah, I believe so. That's where Vavadi writes based on the Mechaber. But I'm not getting into that right now. The Mechaber says in two places that if the Chassan becomes, becomes Mechokol, then that is cause for the girl to break off the Shidduch, or, and, and vice versa. If she, so if he becomes a bum, she could break the Shidduch. If she becomes a bama, I don't know where you go, <laughs> then, uh, then she could, uh, he could break it. Then he could break it. Okay, fine. Rabbi Isai. So now that we're on the topic of the Chassan becoming Mekulkal, I'm going to tell you a fascinating Shaila again. Like we said, this is not for a general audience, but this is a, an amazing case. Very uh, interesting case. Graphic case. That's brought down in Shalta Chuvah's Noyed Behuda. This is a Chuvah from his son. The son of Noyed Behuda brings a case where the Kala said that uh, she wants to break off the deal. Why? Because the Chassan became a bum. How do we know he became a bum? But he's learning in, in Kailal every day. He became a bum. He tried to be Ma'anasar. The Kala says the Chassan tried to rape her. They brought the Shaila to the son of Noyed Behuda. Son of Mary Dehuda says, she says, he tried to be Ma'anasar. Could she break off the Shidduch just based on that? He says, no, he, no, she can't. Why not? He says, first of all, she didn't say he did it. She said, he tried to do it. <coughs> she stopped him. But at the end of the day, he didn't do it. He would have done it. Maybe if she wouldn't have stopped him, at the last moment he would have done tshuva and he wouldn't have done it. We say, come on, I mean, he, he tried to do it and she, and she fought with him. Says the son of Yehuda, just because he wanted to do it. He says, He says, even though you say it's not that he stopped himself, she stopped him. Says the son of we don't know what would have happened. Maybe at the last moment he would have seen the most the and he wouldn't have done it. And meanwhile, she lost her trust in him. Number two, number two, he's a kolo younger light. <laughs> Mistama, all his learning, it would have stopped him in the last moment. Maybe. Maybe he's a rapist. Number three. But, but he's, he's, obviously he's not a good guy because why was he beyichud with his kala? Ah, There's right. an, us, it's us for the and kala to be beyichud. Why? Why? Because yeah. she's a nida. You know, I'll be meyachid with her. If we boy got, so, right? It would be iser drabon on a beyichud. Says the, the son of the Yehuda, does that make him a makokol? Not everybody knows this halacha. Unfortunately, Bavin is in Arabim. There are many people who are over on the halacha. So it's a halacha, even if it's asr, if it's not well known, it's not widespread, and there are people who are over it, it doesn't necessarily render the guy a makokol. And, and number four says the son of the night of Yehuda. Even if he would have done it, he only did it once. Makokol is somebody who violates something repetitively. Just because once, he says, Mayasa ben Shlayachta, what do you think is going to happen? They're, the Bayichar. Why do you think the Chacham Amasr Yichar? And finally, he says, Anoid of Yehuda, son of Anoid Yehuda, who said he tried to do it? Who said? She said! Hashkaya, she's Pasoledos. It's Nagea her. We don't believe a word she said. He has a Cheskis Kashas, and she's not believed. So she's not allowed to break the Shinnah. But she doesn't want it. You can no, she wants it. She doesn't want it. She didn't want, if she didn't want him, she might have said a, a different story. Oh. She, would have, she would have made up better. She would have said he did it many times. No. It's not... That's the, that's the tshuva. That's the tshuva. What about the girl uh, um, expects to marry the chassan and you know, they told him, this guy is Mitsuyun, he's the best guy in Lakewood, he is a bigger lamb than the Shankas Arye. <laughs> and it comes out, he comes, the Shver said news, uh, Zagibur, he opens up the Gemara upside down, he doesn't even know a Rashi from a Toysus. All bets are off. You could break the shit up. Because especially, the whole arrangement was based on the financial arrangement. Why do they want to give the money? They want, they want to get something. And it's, it's most of the way shricha, the Pais can say. Tais says in Adarim, if somebody, if somebody makes efforts to become a Tamil Chacham, it's very likely they will be. And the fact that this guy didn't, it's like a rare, a rare mum that, that was unexpected, and this, is, this might be different. What about... Here, by the way, number 21, you have a whole long laundry list of situations and cases where 
certain circumstances may come up. And now the question is, is that enough of a reason to break the shirk? Let's say the question is, uh, they told the chassan that the girl was 26 years old. And it turns out she's 78. <laughs> <laughs> what? So in that case you probably could break. But the Chassam Soifer talks about a case where they told him that she was 26 <laughs> and she's 39. <laughs> so, um, so that's the situation. Oh, or another situation was uh, the girl was coming, uh, she was wearing a mask. Turned out she took off the mask, and the, the length of the af was a little bit longer than he anticipated. So these are all situations and circumstances that are discussed in the place game. Okay. However, even in situations where maybe it's mutter to break it off, some place can still say it shouldn't be done. It shouldn't be done. And then the Sefer Hinesun Kel Chasam, he brings down... You should refrain from doing so. Unless there's a chashash that maybe things won't work out, there won't be b'shalim. But there is a, a certain uh, maxim that they say in the Velt. There's an expression they say in the Velt. The following, it's Margul B'hun De'inchi, Mutav L'Kroya Klaf V'lo Yikaro Niyar. Means, better to tear up, better to tear up, a get than to tear up the tenayim, which means better to get engaged, get married, mm-hmm. and if there, a get is necessary to give a get, than to break up the tenayim. Better to have a divorce even than to break up a shidduch. And the reason is, like we said, because there's a cherem, there's a cherem against breaking a shidduch. A get, there's a parsha on the Torah of Gittim. There's such a parsha. So, in fact, I know Gedolei Yisrael that uh, even even they, they uh, follow this, that they will advise Bachram, who after the engagement are choyshesh, maybe they say, maybe better to have a get than to have a broken engagement. Again, this is not halach l'maysa, everyone should ask their own uh, competent, um, very competent paisik. There's a problem that she can get married to a coin if she's a grusha. If she's not a grusha, then she still can get married to a coin. What can you do? You give her the opportunity. There's a cherem. Can't break the cherem. Can't break the cherem. Oh, now, if both parties agree, if both parties agree to um, mutually break the shidduch, to break the engagement, then um, you do not, then there's no cherem. However, the minog is to, uh, to try to attain shtar uh, peturin, a document that says that both sides um, are moichal each other of any of the financial uh, commitments and any of the agmas nefesh they may have caused each other. The, the precise nusach of the shtar piturin is uh, unclear. It doesn't really say in any of the svarim and any of the achorinim what the precise nusach of the shtar piturin is. In the Shal Tzachuva Sri Deish, in Chela Gimel, Simen Chavav, he brings down that regarding the right nusach of the shtar piturin, any yodea nusach meyuchal shtar piturin. I don't know of any specific terminology. In the Sefer Nachla Shiva, where he brings down all the nuschais of all the different shtarais, he doesn't bring, he doesn't bring the nusach of the shtar piturin. It's not brought down in the Sefer Ha'itur, and therefore the Yisri Deish, uh, Chil Yaakov Weinberg writes that any rav could write any language that he wants, just to um, enunciate the idea that each party is, is Michael the other party for any finance. Okay, so that's the, that's the situation if both parties agree to break off the Shidduch. But even so, we said that it's possible even when both parties agree, royally Manamikach is better not to. Now, what do you do with all the gifts? All the gifts that were given in a situation where the uh, Chassan gave the Kala gifts, the Chassan gave the Kala um, family gifts, vice versa, so the halach is everything is returned. Everything has to be uh, returned to respective parties. Um, what if they spend money on perishables? That's a shaila. Is machlok is haposkim about that? But these are all issues that come up. Yeah. What? Raising Hashem's name in a get? In a soda. Not in a get. I'm sorry, in, 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 in the partial soda, raising Hashem's name. Okay. Okay, uh, so 
I'm just trying to yeah. uh, parallel here. I, I don't understand that the, the breaking of a harem could be could be worse than 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 creating a situation where two people are now divorced instead of have never been having being married. I hear it's a very sensitive and difficult topic, uh, but there is. I guess one vantage point is that there's no there's no cherem against having the get, as opposed to the the uh, the binding of the tanaim and the binding of the vart, which is a cherem, and there's no real creation of how to uh, how to sever it. There is no there's no way to to disconnect it. The, so better to go through it. I mean that's one way of looking. It's better to go through it and then and then break it, than to break it at a stage. Again, I'm not saying this is halach lemaisa and should be done in, in all cases, but that's that's the logic of it. That's the logic of it. Um, he brings down number 24 in the Yotzer Apoiskim. He brings in the name of the Shem Aryeh that uh, people are very afraid to break such a thing, even where it's mutar al pidin. And he says, especially anoshim rei mushleimim and in ruach hachomim noicha to be mavatal the shidduch. Okay. So I want to end with a really a mind-boggling incident, a historical incident. We have on the, uh, on the, bottom, the back of your sheets, the back of your booklet, meet Rav Mordechai Benet. Mordechai Benet was the acclaimed Gadol Hadar. He lived from 1753 to 1829. He was the Gadol Hadar in Moravia for many, many years. And, and um, at the age of 60 years old, Rav Mordechai Benet began to suffer various ailments until uh, the doctors finally told, told him, you know, in the olden days, they didn't believe in medicine. All they believed in is that if anybody had any troubles, what do you do? You go to the spa. So they used to go to Karlsbad, Marienbad, and they used to bathe in the mineral springs and, and the waters. And they ordered, Rav Mordechai Benet was ordered to go to Karlsbad. And he came to Karlsbad in Tammuz of the year... 1829. And he comes to Karlsbad and he starts to drink the waters of Karlsbad and he says the waters in Karlsbad were so toxic, so disgusting. They entered my body, they caused me terrible cramps, it, it started to weaken his, his body, weaken his abdomen, weaken his artery, arteries and ligaments. And finally, 17 days later, the God of Hadar, Rav Mordechai Benet, passed away on a Wednesday. Yud Gimel, Menachem Av, 1829. And he's in Karlsbad, where are they going to bury him? So they want to bring him to the nearest Jewish city, and they bring him to the city of, of Lamed Shin. What's the city of Lamed Shin? Lichtenstadt. Lichtenstadt. And they bring him to Lichtenstadt. And as they're burying him in Lichtenstadt, his son, Naftali, who is one of the a great God of Israel. His son says, I want everyone to know we're just burying here, here, him here in Lichtenstadt temporarily. But ultimately, we're going to take him to Kivrei Avois. We're going to bring him to Nunshin, Nunshin <coughs> Neistat, to Nicholsburg, where he was the Rav of Nicholsburg. Rav Mordechai Benet, the God was the Rav of Nicholsburg. He was the Talmud of Rav Shmir Shmelka, Shmir Shmelka in Nicholsburg. And in fact, his whole life, he was always heard saying that he always wanted to be buried next to his Rebbe, Rav Shmuel Shmelka, me Nicholsburg. In fact, his wife, um, the wife of Mordechai Benet, was, uh, he, she used to daven that she should die before him so that he could say Kaddish for her, he could outlive her and say Kaddish for her. And he would ask, she asked him one time, she said, when I die, could you bury me right here next to Rav Shmuel Shmelka, me Nicholsburg? And he said, no way, over my dead body, I'm going to be buried next to Rav Shmuel Shmelkom in Nicholsburg, and you're going to be buried next to my feet. That's what he told him. So, uh, Rav Naftali, when he buried his father, he said very clearly that, um, he said that we're only burying my, our father here temporarily, we're going to uproot him and move him back to, Lichten, uh, to uh, Nicholsburg. Okay, what happened was, came a few days later, they wanted a... Uh, um, in a disinter her. They wanted to remove his, his, his remains and bury him in, in, uh, Nicholsburg. in Nicholsburg. And the problem was it was illegal. Because in the olden days, you couldn't exhume bodies. You couldn't uh, remove remains. It was considered very dangerous. The bodies uh, were considered contaminated. And in order to remove the remains uh, of somebody who passed away, you needed to get a permit. 
So they didn't know what to do. They first they went to Vienna to get a permit, and in Vienna they did not offer and they did not issue any permit. Finally, they came to the city of Prague, and in Prague they said, you want to move a body? It's very dangerous to move a body. It's toxic to move a body. Here's the deal. You put him in a grave, you put him in a coffin, and you smear the coffin with oil and spices and fragrant aromas and you disinfect it and then you put it in another coffin and then you smear the outside of that coffin with all kinds of sprays and fragrant aromas and spices and katoiras and you burn incense around it and then you put him in a third coffin and for that we give you a permit to, to move his remains so they come to remove his remains and sir and they decide that, one second, the rub of the city of, uh, of Neistat, of, excuse me, of Lichtenstadt says, remove his remains. Do you have a heter from any rub to remove his remains? Who said you could remove his remains? Maybe it's not Mutter. Show me, uh, show me a psak that you let her move him. After all, the entire city of Lichtenstadt was up in arms that they wanted to move the Gadol Hadar. They said, we were Zoycha to have the Gadol Hadar buried in our midst. We were Zoycha. We were Zoycha. Right? Because we say, a mace is kind of a kaimai. So leave him here. So the Rav was very smart. And the Rav said like this. If the Rav would say it's us to do something, nobody would listen. The Rav said, but maybe you're incurring the wrath of, uh, of Shamayim. You know, once you invoke something superstitious, oh, everybody gets very nervous when you invoke the superstitious. So they got nervous. So the sons of Ramon Chabanet sent a shaila to three of the G'day Hadar. And that is, who do they send the Shaila to? Number one, the son of the Noida Behuda. Number two, Rabbi Kivager. And number three, they sent the Shaila to the great Chsam Seifer. And this whole story is, um, is brought down in the Shaila Sechuvah's Chsam Seifer. You have it on your sheets over here. In number 29, where they, uh, sent, where they sent the Shaila to the Chsam Seifer. Is it permitted to remove the remains of Ramart Chabanet and move him to uh, Nicholsburg. So, and they offered four arguments to the Chsam Sofer why it should be mutter. Number one, everybody knows, the Gemara talks about that people feel more comfortable being buried together with their ancestors. It's more comfortable for a person. The one time I was driving some old ladies to Levaya and they were talking about where they wanted to be buried. So one of them said, they don't like a certain cemetery, it's right by the highway, it's too noisy over there. And the other one said, you know, once you're in the ground, you don't really, you don't really hear it. But apparently it's more comfortable to be buried among the family, and therefore it's, it would be a bigger covet for Rav Mordechai Benet. First of all, Rav Mordechai Benet's mother was buried in Nicholsburg. Number two, his wife was buried in Nicholsburg. His children were buried in Nicholsburg. He had grandchildren buried in Nicholsburg. That's where his whole Kivriya uh, 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 Mishpachta was. It would be more comfortable for him. Plus... So how, to begin, it in the end, the what? To begin. To begin what? To begin it, but then it's a body. To, to bury it there. Why, why bury it here and then uh, bury it there? They had a bury. He was the closest spot. Was, uh, he died in Karlsbad and they had to take him to... To uh, Lichtenstein, that was the closest Malcolm to bury him. Now that he's buried, now they wanted to move him to uh, to to uh, Nicholsburg. Okay. The second argument he said is his whole life he said he wanted to be buried next to his Rebbe of Shmuel Shmalka. And if that that was the that was the desire of the mess. In fact, there was a great God. There was a great Shoichet uh, by the name of Rav Gabriel Ibishitz who testified that he was together with Ramor Chabanet every single night on his deathbed. And every night Ramor Chabanet says, please, 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 bury me in Nicholsburg, bury me in Nicholsburg, bury me in Nicholsburg. And at the very least, bring me to Prague. So besides it being more comfortable for him, that was also his desire. Number three, they said to the Chsam Seifer. Number three, they said to Chsam Seifer that Rav Naftali, his son who buried him, he announced that he's burying him with Kavana with the intention to move him eventually. And number four, Lichtenstadt. Who ever heard of Lichtenstadt? It's a far darbanist city. Nobody goes there. It's surrounded by mountains. Nobody ever is going to go to be Mispal all over there. You have to take like a camel up some kind of mountain. Nobody's ever going to get there. If he was buried in, in Nicholsburg, people are going to be able to be uh, on his kever. 
So, Rabbi Isai, the question was brought to the Chassam Soifer, and, and, Chassam Soifer said, I don't agree with any of your reasonings. I don't agree with any of your rationales. I don't agree with that. Number one, you say that every night he asked to be buried next to Rav Shmuel Shmalka. Who's saying that he wanted to be buried next to Rav Shmuel Shmalka? Rav Gavriel Ibishitz. Who is this guy, Rav Gavriel Ibishitz? What city is he from? He's from Nicholsburg. No kidding, he's saying that the Rebbe said he wants to be buried in Nicholsburg. Anybody who comes to that city is Noigei Abadaro. He doesn't believe him. He has no, we don't believe him. He has no credibility. Of course he's going to say that his Rebbe said he wants to be buried in Nicholsburg. So we can't believe him. He's Noigei. He's a bias. He, he, he has a prejudice in this case. We can't accept anything he says. We can't believe him. Number two, especially in light of the fact that Mordechai Benet said that once he passes away, any of his Talmidim that come to be Mishtatech on, on his kever, he's going to intercede in Shemayim on their behalf. So of course the whole city would want him to be, marry, be buried in Nicholsburg. So says the Chabsam Sarver, but maybe you'll say that they're saying that he said, please bury me in Nicholsburg, and at the very least Prague. Now, to marry him in Prague, he's not Nagyabadavar. They're not Nagyabadavar because they don't live in the city of Prague. So you could exhume him to bury him in Prague. Now, once you take him out to bury him in Prague, then you might as well bring him to Nicholsburg. Says Achsam Seifer, no, they would still be Nagyabadavar to bury him in Prague because Prague is a lot closer to Nicholsburg than Lichtenstadt is. So the Chassam Soifer says, I don't accept that argument. Says the Chassam Soifer. But everybody heard him say that he wants to be buried next to Rav Shmuel Shmalka. He was obviously Michael on that. Because if he later said, bury me in Nicholsburg, and if not that, at least in Prague, that means he had given up hope of being buried next to Rav Shmuel Shmalka. <coughs> Otherwise he never would have said, at least bury me in Prague. But says the Chassam Soifer, the argument that you're using, that Rav Naftali buried him on condition to move him, that's a valid argument. And therefore, says Achsam Seifer, it would seem to me that you could move Rav Mart Chabanet. And then Achsam Seifer says, but you know what? After thinking about it a little bit more, maybe it's not such a good idea. Because everybody knows that in many of the cities, there's no more space for burial places anymore. And they're creating new cemeteries outside of the city. And the, and the governors of the city, they want to create roads through the old Batek Faris. And we always have to fight with them not to, not to trample, not to be mezalzel in, in our kvarim. And they say, what's the problem? Move them? And we say, no, you can't move a kever. So if now we're going to go ahead and move Ramar Chai Benet, then you're undermining the whole movement of standing up for Kedusha at kvarim. So therefore, if we're going to move Ramar Chai Benet, that, that's going to cause a zilzal. People are going to say, if you move the God of Hadar, even though he wanted to and he asked to and they, he was buried on condition to move him, it's going to undermine the whole movement to try to preserve Kivrei Yisrael. Says the Chassam Sarev, maybe it's better not to. But then after thinking about it a little bit more, you know what, if you could explain to people that this is a unique circumstance, that he was the rub of Nicholsburg and they buried him on condition to move him, it would seem that it would be permitted to move him. This is a very unusual tshuva Nachsam Soifer. Chassam Soifer is always definitive in his psaq. Chassam Soifer would write tshuvas. If he got a question, he would immediately write an answer and send it out. Chassam Soifer said about himself that even if he wrote a halacha and he based it on three gemaras and you shlugged up all three gemaras, all his rayas, he would still say the psaq. Why? Because he knows he has siyata the shmaya that he's going to get the right psaq. Chassam Soifer never wavered. And here Chassam Soifer says, it's, it should be Aser, it should be Mutter, maybe better not to. Okay, do it. What's going on over here? So I'm going to tell you the most astounding story you ever heard. Some Seifer's son, Reb Shimon Seifer, writes, let me tell you what happened in this case. Let me tell you what happened here. Some Seifer was a rat about to pen a chuba. you can move Ramar Chaibanet. And he suddenly fell asleep. And he had a dream. And who came to him in the dream? Ramor Chai Benet. And Ramor Chai Benet says, I'm sorry for you got the right psaq. You can move my remains. But not yet. Why not? Because you need to know that many, many years ago, I was engaged to the Rebetzin of Lichtenstadt. And I broke the engagement. Oh my gosh. 
And I was buried next to her in Liechtenstein for seven months, corresponding to the seven months that I broke the engagement. Oh, wow. And I caused her tsar. And because of that, Shamaim, even though I was permitted to break the Shidduch, they're being Mitzar me seven months to be buried next to her for seven months. Oh. So, so write the halach is its mutter, but don't write the letter yet for seven months until I lay there for seven months next to this Rebetzin. And then you could issue the psaq to move me. The kachava, seven months later, the chsam soifer mailed the tshuva, and they moved the remains of Mordechai Benet. There are different versions of the story. One version is, he wasn't engaged to her, but he passed in to someone else that they could break a shidduch, and in order to be, um, in order to be mechabe, that person, he needed to be buried next to her for seven months. Rabbi Sai, the, the shir is not halach lamaisa, but what we should take out of the shir is the yisod of Rabbi Yaakov Kamenetsky. That says Rabbi Yaakov, he's not bothered how Yaakov Inu can marry his sisters. You know how he can marry Le- Rachel? Because he said he would do it. And if you commit yourself to do something, you're absolutely bound to keep your word. Rabbi, have a great day. You've just experienced another Torah class brought to you by TorahAnytime.com.